the County of Toowoomba and Monmouthshire Central Advertiser, Abergavenny and Raglan Herald, Usk and Pontypool Messenger and Chepstow Argus introduce us to the life and exploits of the renowned King Arthur and his Knights of the Round Table. Chapter 6 The soldier now of hope, he stands conspicuous, fame and great renown, brought within the compass of the sword. Like the green thorn of May, my fortune flowers, he glorious stars, high heaven's resplendent host, to whom I oft have of my lot complained, hear and record my soul's unaltered wish, dead or living, let me but be renowned hope. Sir Kay misses his sword, Arthur goes in quest of one, Merlin desires him to go to the church and pull the sword out of the stone. The sword is brought to Sir Kay. Sir Ector pronounces it to be Excalibur. Sir Ector, Sir Kay and Arthur go to the stone. Arthur replaces the sword in the stone and no one can draw it out besides himself. Arthur declared king trial of the drawing of the sword put off to Easter and from thence to Pentecost, Sir Ector disclaims Arthur as his son. Sir Kay and Arthur having looked round for a time on the knights and ladies, the former put his hand to his side and lifted his baldric and his surprise was great to find it supported no weapon. A malsense upon my thoughtlessness, exclaimed Sir Kay, stamping his foot with vexation. I have left my sword at my father's house. I pray you ride back and fetch it for me. That will I with right good will, said Arthur, and was proceeding on his way when an armourer who was on his knees fastening on his master's leg armour looked up and cried out to Arthur as he passed, You will find a good sword in the next tent. Thanks, Owen, returned Sir Kay, and turning to his brother, he added, Go, Arthur and lose no time in fetching it, for the trumpet calls. Arthur hurried away towards the tent, but ere he reached it, an old man with a long white beard touched him on the arm as he passed. Seek it not there, said the stranger. Father, where else? cried Arthur as he turned to the old man in astonishment. Go to the church and draw forth the sword you will find stuck in the stone. Arthur was about to question the old man, but he strode rapidly away and mixed with the crowd. What can this mean? thought Arthur. However, come wheel Come woe, I will ride to the churchyard and bring away the sword if I may. So, setting spurs to his horse, he galloped towards the church. Upon reaching the spot, 
he threw the reins upon the neck of his horse and alighted as he approached the stone. He gazed upon the sword that stood shining in the sunlight and read the inscription. Then, looking round and finding he was alone, he went into the adjoining tent and found it empty, for the ten knights who had been placed to watch the sword had gone to the jousts. Arthur then returned to the church door, and after a moment's hesitation, he approached the stone and seized the sword by the hilt, drew it lightly from the stone. Then, trembling with joy, he remounted his steed and rode back to the field of the tournament. As he entered his brother's tent, Sir Kay turned to him and sharply rebuked him for the delay, saying, Why hast thou lingered? Thrice the trumpets have sounded, and I am unprepared. Pardon, dear brother, replied Arthur, for the prize I have brought you is worth the delay. Arthur then recounted all that had occurred since he left the tent and presented the sword. Sir Kay listened with breathless anxiety and feeling of awe. This is a miracle, said he, yet can it be that I am the elect Pendragon of England? It must be so, replied Arthur, for you are my elder brother, and the less worthy, said Sir Kay. We must to our father and tell him. At this moment, Sir Hector entered to reprove his son Fedalion. At your age, said he, I was ever the first in the field and the last to leave it. Sir, said Sir Kay, I had left my sword at home and sent Arthur to find one. Sir Hector glanced at the weapon with amazement and excitedly exclaimed, It is Excalibur. How come it here? My brother Arthur, said Sir Kay, brought it to me. It is the sword of the stone, and therefore I am king of this land. The old knight heeded not the last remark, but turning to Arthur said, How gottest thou the sword? Sir, I will tell you, replied Arthur. When I went to seek a sword for my brother, I met an old man. Merlin, I doubt not, but go on, said Sir Hector. He bade me to go to the cathedral, and there I should find what I was seeking. I should have asked him wherefore this command, but when I looked towards where he had been standing, he had vanished as if by magic. So, thinking my brother should not be swordless, I went thither with all haste and drew the sword out of the stone without effort. Found you not knights about the sword guarding it? asked Sir Hector. No, sir, answered Arthur. They had all gone to the tourney. Then said Sir Hector, much amazed and looking steadfastly at Arthur, if it indeed be thus, Tis thou shalt be king of all this land, and God will have it so. For none but he who is rightwise Lord of Britain might draw this sword forth from the stone. But 
let me now with mine own eyes see thee put back the sword into its place and draw it forth again. Sir Ector grasped the hand of Arthur and looked admiringly into his face, saying, It needed not Merlin's wondrous art to approve the birthright of him upon whose brow is set the impress of sovereignty. But come, let us return to the cathedral and see if you can put the sword where it was and draw it forth again. That is no mastery, said Arthur. As they spoke, the trumpets rang out their stirring blast, and the shouting of the people resounded from the tilting ground. But they thought no more of the jousting, and hurried to the churchyard, where they found the stone and anvil, but the knights were still absent. Now a say, said Sir Ector, taking the sword from Arthur and handing it to his son. Sir Kay took the weapon and, poising it for a moment, struck it upon the anvil, but the steel rang upon the iron and then glanced off without making the slightest impression. He again and again attempted to achieve the feat, but all his efforts proved of no avail. Now, Arthur, take the sword, said Sir Ector. The youth seized the sword, which he flourished aloft, and with one swift downward blow struck the point into the stubborn iron and left the noble falchion quivering there. Sir Rector tried with main force to draw out the sword, but it would not yield to all his efforts. Then Sir Kay seized the handle with both hands and setting his foot hard against the stone tugged so violently that the sweat rolled from his heated brow and his limbs trembled from the strain, but he was forced at last to reel backwards out of breath. Arthur now approached and with a light fillip pulled the weapon from the anvil. It is a marvel, said Arthur, tossing the shining brand high in the air and catching it as it fell. But it seems amiss that I, the younger born, should be preferred to my elder brother. Then Sir Ector fell down on his knees before young Arthur and Sir Kay also with him and straightway owned him as their sovereign lord. Alas, my dear father and brother, cried Arthur, as he raised the old knight with affectionate veneration. Why kneel to me? It is your aid and loving counsel that I need, and not this homage. Nay, my lord Arthur, exclaimed Sir Ector, we are of no blood kinship with thee, and little though I thought how high thy kin might be, yet wast thou never more than foster child of mine. And then he told him all he knew about his infancy, and how a stranger had delivered him with a great sum of gold into his hands, to be brought up and nourished as his own born child and then had disappeared and added, I wot well that you are of nobler blood than I thought you were, and though no longer a son to me, you will become my good and gracious Lord when you are king. When Arthur heard these things, he fell upon Sir Ector's neck and wept bitterly, crying, Else were I to blame, for are you not in all the world 
the man to whom I am most beholden, and to my good lady and mother, your wife, who has so well fostered and cherished me, and if it be heaven's will that I be king, as you say, you shall desire of me what I may do, and I shall not fail you. I will but pray, replied Sir Ector, that you will make my son and your foster brother, Sir Kay, seneschal of all your lands. That shall be so, said Arthur, and more, by the faith of my body. Never man shall have the office but he, while he and I do live. Come then, said the old knight, let us to his grace the archbishop, and tell him how the sword was achieved, and by whom. And when the archbishop saw the sword in Arthur's hand, he set a day apart, and summoned all the princes, knights and barons, to meet again at St. Paul's Church, and see the will of heaven signified. The news of Arthur's achievement soon spread throughout the land, and many of the lords were enraged, thinking it a shame to the realm to be governed by a mere boy. On the day appointed, the sword was put back in the anvil by Arthur, and all tried from the greatest to the least to move it, but there before them all not one could move it save Arthur alone. At this a great confusion and dispute arose, for some cried out it was the will of heaven, and long live King Arthur, but many were more full of wrath and said, What? Would ye give the ancient scepter of this land unto a boy born none know how? And the contention growing greatly until nothing could be done to pacify their rage. The meeting was broken up and the trial put off till Candlemas, when it was arranged that all the barons should assemble again. When Candlemas was come, there was a vast gathering of the nobility and commonality, and many great lords attempted to draw the sword from the stone, but none could prevail but Arthur. Then were the barons sorely vexed, and the party opposed to his accession had grown so strong that after an obstinate debate, it was resolved to defer the decision until Easter. At Easter, another trial was made, and Arthur, being again the one that could draw out the sword, it was arranged that a further delay should take place until the Feast of Pentecost, at which season it was unanimously agreed that an assembly should be held whose verdict should be considered final and decisive. But now the Archbishop, fully seeing God's will, called together by Merlin's council a band of knights and men-at-arms and set them about Arthur to keep him safely till the Feast of Pentecost. The powerful knights set to guard Arthur with those whom Uther Pendragon had placed most confidence in in his days, amongst whom were Sir Borderwine, Sir Ulfius, and Sir Brastius, and the whole realm of Britain waited in anxious suspense for the great day that should settle Arthur's claim to the crown of Britain.